We are talking today to director Martin Campbell, the director of such great films as The Foreigner, Casino Royale, GoldenEye, Vertical Limit, uh, Green Lantern, and the newest film starring Maggie Q, Samuel L. Jackson, and Michael Keaton, the film we're talking about today, The Protégé. Martin, thank you so much for talking to us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, tell me simply what attracted you to this project. Uh, just I, I was um, I was fascinated by the script. I thought that the uh, uh, for this type of movie, I thought the script was um, you know was really good, um, really good characters, um, and uh, a, a narrative that is unusual for this type of film because it's a story that you're never quite sure where it's headed. Um, has a lot of surprises in it, and. Um, uh, it, it was really there because a lot of these movies, um, particularly sort of uh, female action pictures, I guess male action pictures, the stories are pretty mundane. It relies on the action so much, if you see what I mean, that it, it um, that uh, this was unusual in that it was a fascinating storyline and fascinating characters. Well, that, that's interesting. And it leads sort of into my next question, which is that, for this film, which seems to be a common thread in The Foreigner and in Casino Royale, you have a script, dialogue, and drama, and action, and court fight choreography that are all on a high level. They're all on par. And one of the things you pointed out is 100% correct. Sometimes it's you know, a, great, a great script and great drama, and the action suffers sure. the other way around. Martial arts classically have great martial arts scenes and the dialogue. This film and those other films, it is very, very much on par. So tell me a little bit about that in terms of the, the, pro the process of the film, in terms of, of putting it together. Was that something that was um, in your mind consciously in terms of the execution of the, of the project? Yeah, you know, the, the, these movies stand or fall on, uh, the action is one thing, but also their characters, you know, the, the, the relationships and the characters. Um, and... Uh, that, that was really paramount in this uh, establishing between Sam Jackson and um, Maggie, this kind of father-daughter relationship. And of course, you know, above all the Keaton relationship, which was, um, you know, tonally it had to be in the right area. Um, it had to have the humor and the sparks going between them, if you will. Um, and uh, for me, that was the most important thing in the movie was to try and achieve that. Um, both superb actors, well, the whole three of them were, but certainly Michael and Maggie, uh, in terms of their relationship there, I think they pulled it off very successfully. Well, I, I would agree. And, and I, one of the strengths, I think, of the film in, in seeing it, and I saw it twice, oh. is uh, there is a chemistry between Michael Keaton and Maggie Q that really, uh, there's a great connection there and it jumps off the screen. Um, is that something in... Uh, the inception that you expected? Is it something that evolved along the way or is it something that really um, you, you were, had a hand in, in crafting? Because it really is probably uh, unique in, in how strong their chemistry is for the scenes that they are on, that they share. Yeah, look, I think the, it was always there in the original script. That, that, the, 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 the relationship between them and the tone of it was always there in the original script now we did quite a lot of work on character work and stuff like that uh, and also on the action but really what Richard did Richard Wenk um, he he kind of created those characters and it was always there on the page so it was just a matter of getting the balance right when we did it you know uh, to see what the actors would bring to the party and uh, and really just being I guess, um, truthful to, you know, the, the way the script was originally written. Now, M Maggie Q, um, it seems to me that it's a perfect vehicle for her. She's, she's really ideal in the role. Uh, is that something that evolved that uh, the film was built around uh, crafting it to meet her strengths or did she rise up to that challenge to, um, meet the character because it really is. It seems that uh, I couldn't think of a film where you could have plugged anyone in more um, effectively than she is in in this role. Well, 
Well, she rose to it, quite honestly. The point is that when I cast her, I only knew her as I'd, I'd seen some material with her. I, I'd never heard of her before that. And I saw some material that she, with her acting, which I thought was terrific. I had no idea of her background in terms of action, which I subsequently learned was obviously a big plus for us. And, uh, and um, she loved the part. And uh, really, she rose to the occasion. That's what it was. She she really worked very hard, right? And she um, and uh, she, she did terrifically well with it. You know, all credit to her. The flip side of that relationship is you have Michael Keaton, who certainly in his younger days he um, he shocked the world in in terms of his ability to do action in in uh, the the Tim Burton Batman film, but a guy who's not necessarily known for, certainly for fight and action choreography. Um, he certainly aged some since, since Batman, but yet in this role, he also uh, is very adept. Um, many, many fight scenes in, in which he is, uh, it, it's clearly uh, him there um, doing the choreography. Uh, how did that evolve? How, uh, you know, it was, really somewhat shocking to me ple pleasantly so but shocking to me when I, when I saw the film yeah the thing is that um you know, you know Michael was not sort of not as adept obviously as Maggie as he would be the first to tell you um but those fight scenes are worked out very carefully they're rehearsed you know Michael rehearses on his days off and so forth there's a you know you have to those scenes you have to know exactly what you're doing um so you know he and what you want is an actor that commits to that. You know, some actors are a little reluctant to get involved in action and stuff because, you know, they'll say to you, well, can you use my double? Well, in this case, no, I'm not going to let you use your double. You do it yourself. And Michael sort of, um, he really relished sort of doing it and, and, and trying to do it right. So you're absolutely right. I didn't double him that much. You know, he, 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 had, he had rehearsed this stuff. He knew what he was doing, and obviously the slightly more dangerous moments sure. you can't you can't put an actor in that situation because any injury would be a disaster. So, um, but he did do, uh, you know, he did do a lot of his own stuff. Now I had heard today uh, uh, that, I, which I was unaware of previously, that Maggie had come into the film after a fairly serious uh, surgery to to her back. Yes. How did that impact um, the fight and stunt choreography as it related to her? Because again, she is all over the place in this in this film. Tremendous fighting, tremendous stunts, uh, very visually up up front. Um, were there adjustments that needed to be made, or did she was, was she able to power through? Yeah, she powered through. There was, to be honest, she um, uh, you wouldn't have known that she had she had had that problem. She she simply came on um, and. Uh, I didn't know it for a while at all, but she was never, ever did she back away from it because of her operation. That's incredible. It's incredible to see the film. And then here I heard that story afterward. And I, it's, it's <laughs> certainly not noticeable when you certainly wouldn't think to yourself, there's somebody who who just came out of a back surgery. So pretty. Impressive. I know. I know. Because back surgery. God, that can be tricky. Certainly. Now, you know, we're, we're in an environment where films are seen in so many different um types of medium, um, particularly over the course of the pandemic, much of the stuff was tailored towards sc uh, small screens, people's homes, uh, things of that nature. Uh, again, I, I had the ability to screen this on the big screen and uh, in a smaller screening, and the film holds up in, in both of those environments. Yet in terms of when you made the film, was there a particular mindset as a director? Do you, um, do you think to yourself, uh, of the film on uh, how it will show on the large screen or is it, is it irrelevant to you? Well, to be honest, we, you always think of it going on the large screen. You know, that's the point when you make it, you, you're not thinking about the television uh, screen. You always, and don't forget, you know, when we made this COVID was uh, really in its early stages. So um, I've always considered all my movies going on the big screen. Of course they get, you know, of course, they get to, sold to television and TV um, later on. But it's uh, I always just make them for the big screen. That's really uh, it. Hold it. Certainly, it certainly visually is a stunning film. 
Um, and I, like I said, it certainly played out well on both of those, um, sure. both of those vehicles. Um, one of the things that we've in, in our conversations with people on film today, film today seems to be, unless you have the monstrous, monstrous budgets of some of these films, that one of the great concerns, particularly in action films and films where fight choreography and um, stunts are needed is that the amount of time to make a film, there's so much more pressure to make a film quickly and, and come under budget uh, and yet still be able to deliver uh, a, you know, a product that's high. Certainly on a film that's largely a drama uh, or a family type piece, uh, less of an issue. But in a film like The Protégé, which is such an unbelievable, uh, got such unbelievable action um, stunts. How did that play out in, in this film? Did you have, did you feel that you had adequate time to be able to to prep the yeah. actors for the stunts and things? Yeah, you know, it, it's by sort of uh, studio terms, a very low budget on it. Um, and, uh, um, you know, if I had to do it again with a ton more money, it wouldn't be a much different film. It honestly wouldn't. I, 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 I the, the action is the right balance, I think, for the movie. Um, there's no huge CGI numbers or yes, there's an explosion at the end, but beyond that, um, to be honest, the action is simply uh, what is required for the story. And, you know, always with action, you go in thinking, well, how are we going to make this a little bit different? How can we make it a little more interesting? Um, what haven't I seen 500 times before with action? So that, that's the mindset you go into. Um, and uh, to be honest, I think with the action scenes in Protégé, I think they're all the right length. And I think they're the, 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 those scenes, uh, I wouldn't make them any bigger, for example, if I had twice the budget. That's interesting. That's, that, that's, that's very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, you, you've been involved in films that are part of franchises, right? So like the Bond films. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been involved in films that are part of this superhero universe like mm -hmm. Green Lantern. But then mm -hmm. you're involved in a film like this, which is, an, is a standalone. It's, a, it's an independent as it relates to those, those types of things. Sure. Does your approach to the action, the fight choreography, is it the same um, or is it different when it comes to doing a film like Protégé than it is to looking at those other, those other two? You know, the, the action is depending on what your story is. Like, for example, on Zorro, there's a lot of sword fighting. You know, obviously, it's all about sword fighting. And it's, do you know what I mean? It, that, that's what it's about. Um, so the sword play has to be interesting and it has to be, it has to apply to the character of Zorro the same way I think that in Protégé, the action is correct for Maggie and, you know, the, for, for, for the fighting that they do. So really, um, and, you know, in Bond, it's obviously Bond is larger than life and the action scenes are much bigger, if you will. Um, but that's right for those movies because, in Bond, you always start off by saying, well, what hasn't the audience ever seen before? Okay, they haven't seen a tank chase. Well, let's put a tank chase and, you know, let's charge through St. Petersburg and destroy half the city. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and, right. um, you know, in Casino, it was, well, have we seen a parkour chase? That No, we haven't, because parkour at the time we made that was, you know, becoming a big sure. thing. So, you know, that's what you adapt. It's a foot chase, but it's the, the way it develops and so forth is, is pretty exciting. And, you know, at the end, how about a sinking house? Have we ever seen that before? No. Okay, let's do one where they're in Venice and so on and so forth. So all, all of the, those scenes are sort of adapted to the story, as it were, and I think are right for the story. You know, just, just to do a whole, there's nothing worse than action that is unmotivated is not character related and is just a chunk of action. You just get bored rigid by, by that, you know. And, and by the way, the audience have seen this so many times, you know what I mean? Sure. Another car chase and I'll scream. I remember on Bond, um, the scene where she gets kidnapped and he goes after her and they roll the Aston Martin. That was a written as a long car chase through a forest. And I remember saying, this is the most boring sequence I've ever read. How about we have a car chase that's not a car chase? So let's cut all that bullshit, you know, with the thing. And let's do it like this, you know. Right, right. And they put the girl in the middle of the road. He flips the bloody thing and, you know, ends up knocking himself out. And et cetera, et cetera. Do you know what I mean? So you adapt it to 
but the audience have seen just about everything and car chasers being about the most boring i think at the moment i've seen them all you know sure sure i i, I agree now one of the other things one of the threads and you talked about this a little bit but um your films have a tendency to be very um adult they're very gritty um they're very violent in in many respects but yet there is a, a balance of humor that comes through. Certainly in this film, there were moments that I actually laughed out loud. Um, is that a product of your personality and what you try to bring to the table? Or is that a product of the script writer or, or the actors? Tell me a little bit about that. I think it's everybody. You know, the point is that that the... Um... Uh, certainly Richard wrote it with a sense, uh, it certainly had a sense of humor. Um, and I remember, to, you know, it's things like, for example, in the cell where Michael comes out, walks out and he goes up to the really thicko kind of henchman and says, you know, where do you buy your suits, right? Well, yeah, so originally he would come out and just say it directly to him. And I would say to him, Michael, what you do is you go off, you disappear for three seconds and then you reappear. That'll make it That'll make it funnier, right? So, so it's that kind of, do you know what I mean? And so so sure. we've, we've fiddled about with, you know, timing is everything in comedy. Um, and uh, so, so it's that type of thing that we adapted to, although the line itself was written by Richard Wenk, who, you know, who, who wrote the script. So, so that's the kind of, you know, that's how you develop it. And that's how it works. Or you do alternatives, you know, that's the other thing. Maybe it'll work better this way. Will it work better that way? Okay, let's just shoot three different versions of it and see which works best. So, you know, that's the type of thing we do. Similarly, in terms of the action. So you've worked with some folks that, you know, in The Foreigner, which is a really terrific film, working with somebody like uh, Jackie Chan, who is probably one of the most uh, experienced action, uh, sure. both, both actors, directors, choreographers, um, and then you work with uh, Maggie Q, who who has a unlike Michael Keaton, she has a background in, in action. Oh and yeah, in, very in, much. In, and in stunts, um, do they? How much of a role do they play in terms of uh, the the choreography and the execution of that choreography? Well, I think Maggie probably had something to say. The point is that's all rehearsed off screen, as it were, before we actually shoot it. So. What I would do is sit with the um, stunt arranger and I'd say, right, this is where the fight should be. This is what, what it's about, right? And uh, what he would do is he'd come up with some choreographer. And now what stunt arrangers do is they actually tape all this stuff. They put it, you know, they, they shoot it. And then they edit it. To, and they've all become editors, these guys. And, and then they put some awful music on it. Now you watch this thing. And it's, but it's really good because you can actually see the whole fight in sure. real time. And so forth. And then, you know, you can give your notes and say, this is what I want. We can really, we don't need to go from there two steps and then back to there. We can go straight to, it's, it's that kind of thing. And then he rehearses the actors in their days off and so forth, which they have to be, um, they have to know, obviously, because it's dangerous. These things, you can sure. just, you, you know, someone swings a gun and you don't duck low enough and you get hit on the side of the head, even if it's a rubber gun. You know what I mean? It's kind of, and then we, we come to the day and now everybody at least knows what's going on. It's now a matter of refining those scenes, right? Making sure that the action is as sharp as you want it. And that takes some building into sometimes, you know, just to get the actors to sort of, really wind into it and you know really give it a hundred percent um and uh particularly after a while they obviously get tired you know they, it's it's difficult that stuff sure and and physically demanding so and, and that's the way it works basically so michael didn't really have anything to unless it was a move that was impossible for him do you know what i mean a, a move a, a twist a flip, whatever it may be that he just simply was uncomfortable doing because he couldn't really achieve it then you would adapt it if you see what i mean so okay we do this, this and that's that's good maggie on the other hand uh, even in rehearsals i'm sure she had some influence on it um but they were broadly speaking mapped out by the stunt arranger and uh, i simply uh, either modified them refined them or adjusted them and asked for these adjustments and uh, sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. So, you know, that's the way it works. 
Thank you so much. Martin Campbell, uh, director of The Protégé, I thank you so much for speaking to us. I expect great things from, from this film. I believe that the public will receive it uh, really in, in ways that they've received other films like John Wick and, and films of a similar genre. So thank you for talking to Taekwondo Life magazine, and I look forward to talking to you in future projects. It's a, it's a great pleasure.